Well, so excited to be here back with you in the book of Acts. If you want to turn to Acts, it's like two-thirds plus a little bit more through your Bible. We're going to be in Acts chapter 8 today, verses 26 through 40, uh, new life through the old. And, and so here's a question to start off. Do you like things new or do you like them old, right? And, and I probably need to give context to that question because if we went with like food, we'd say definitely new, right? We don't want used food. But uh, uh, when it comes to something like a house, what would you prefer? For something new, something just right off the line, or do you want something that has character, that has been around for decades, that you can just embrace that? Or, or what about a car? What about a car? Uh, how many of you prefer new cars? How many of you prefer old cars? Uh, yeah, okay, so the only car I didn't wreck was my truck, which looks old anyway, right? Got more rust on it than it's worth. But, uh, you know, as, as we think about new and old, uh, what about this? And this is for basketball fans. Uh, Michael Jordan or LeBron James, right? How many say Jordan? Uh, how many say LeBron? Oh, you're wrong. All right, so yeah, so it's Jordan, right? No, but when it comes to old or new, you know, we, we come to different things. But uh, here in today's passage, we're going to see the old and the new collide, right? The Old Testament, which is uh, the first two-thirds of the Bible where God introduces himself and says what life is supposed to be about and also says that Jesus is coming. And that's the second or the last third of the Bible is the New Testament. And so we're going to see the old red and the new realized by a guy on his chariot. So as we jump back into the book of Acts, uh, our series is called Ecclesia. Now this is a, a fancy Greek word that basically, it doesn't mean church, it means gathering, and, and it was used for different gatherings back in the day, and, and the church became known as a, a gathering, the Ecclesia, and that has carried on into our translation of the Bible. And last time we were together in Acts, we saw this guy by the name of Philip. Now, if you remember in Acts chapter 6, Philip was what we would call a deacon. He was, he was picked to serve the widows and was doing a good job of that. And then the last message that I had with you guys before I left was on Philip taking the message to Samaria. Now, if you remember Samaria, the Samaritans, they, uh, they were um, a, a mixed breed that, that the Jewish people did not like. They, they despised the Samaritans. And Philip goes there, and now he comes to a... Uh, Ethiopian eunuch, which back in that day, uh, the Greeks and the Romans, they believed that Ethiopia was the ends of the earth, which is just kind of cool to think about Philip. He started in Jerusalem and, and Judea and then went to Samaria, and now he's taken the message to someone who's going to the ends of the earth, which is what Jesus said in Acts uh, 1.8. But let's jump into the story. We'll read it, and then we'll talk through some things from it and what we can learn from it. So it, beginning with verse 26 of Acts 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip... Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture in the Old Testament and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Some cool things that, that we see here in the story. First of all, about Philip. The angel comes and says something to him. And, and what's Philip do once the angel says, hey, I want you to do something? 
He goes, right? He went. He, he was faithful to go. And, and then we see him uh, being told by the Spirit to get up next to the chariot, and, and the Ethiopian eunuch is reading out loud, which was normal back then. Today, if you go by and someone's reading out loud, you might think they're a little weird. Matter of fact, at the place where we store all the books, you get told to be quiet if you try to read out loud. Uh, but this is what they did back then, and, and, and the Ethiopian is reading Isaiah chapter 53, which is known as the suffering servant chapter. It's, a, it's about the Messiah, the one that God's going to send to save Israel and ultimately the entire earth, uh, all those who trust in him, and that is Jesus. And so he's reading that, and, and Philip comes up next to him. When we think about the Ethiopian eunuch, we might automatically get a, a picture in our mind of, of what a eunuch is according to what we know, and uh, a male that's uh, been castrated. And, and a lot of times they, used, they did that with young men and put them in, in charge of different things and didn't have to worry about them messing around with the harems or all that. Not saying any of that is right. And that could have been the case here with the Ethiopian. We know he, he would be like a minister of finance, right? And so this word eunuch back then also meant uh, a military or political figure. So it could be that he is uh, fully intact uh, and, and just that's his position. All we know is, is he was wanting to know more about the God of Judaism. Now, was he a Jew yet? Had he been proselytized into Judaism? We don't know, but we know that he went to uh, Jerusalem to worship. We know that he's reading Isaiah and he wants to know what Isaiah the prophet is talking about. So he, he's seeking after the truth, right? So he reads Isaiah 53. And, and Philip was right there when he needed to be because he was listening to the Spirit. He was faithful to that. And, and the Ethiopian needed help understanding what the passage meant. And, and in your Bibles, if you look in your Bibles, it's interesting. As, as Philip tells him uh, what, what you need to do to be saved through Jesus and that this was talking about Jesus, uh, the Ethiopian responded, right? He responded in faith. As a matter of fact, in your Bibles, there's this little uh, interesting note. If you have your Bibles on, on verse 37, on verse 37, there won't be anything. It'll just say 37, then it'll go to 38. And, and just so you know what, what that's about, the, uh, what, what happened was there was a, a text that was inserted later on in the later text that we have of the New Testament. But in the earliest text of the New Testament, verse 37 isn't there. So uh, a scribe probably penciled that in, or uh, not, I didn't really do pencils back then, but probably uh, chiseled that in, wrote that in with a quill pen, whatever he did, and, uh, and added this part, verse 37, which says, when the Ethiopian eunuch was responding to the message of Christ, it says, if you believe with all your heart, you may receive Christ, right? And then, and then he answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he said, Jeff, why would you go to a part that's in later texts? Because it's really cool to prove that, that part of the confession of someone who's coming to Jesus Christ uh, that was known by those who were, who were translating and, and putting the, the letters of the, of the word into uh, print, it's, it's interesting to know that they were like, hey, uh, it, it's important that you know Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So it's part of the confession that we still use today. Right? So then he says, hey, there's water. Why should I be baptized? For anybody who's a Christian, if you've heard that story, you've always wanted that to happen in your life, right? You've always wanted to be walking by someone and they say, hey, there's water. Why should I be baptized? Or you're telling someone about Jesus and they're like, hey, I want to do that. The Greek word here, baptizo, means to dip under, to immerse, right, to be submerged. And so they went down into the water and they came back up. And the reason that, I believe the reason that God does this is Romans 6, 4. He says that we were buried with Christ in death and raised to new life just as we remember Jesus was. It's this act of obedience to what he has called us to. Another interesting thing about this is, is after they come up out of the water, Spirit of God takes Philip away. Philip goes on another journey and goes preaching uh, other places. And, and the Ethiopian, I mean, he doesn't get all sad about it, right? I mean, first of all, how many of us would be wigged out if the guy we're talking to all of a sudden disappears and he's gone? And this guy that just told us about Jesus, you're like, oh, man, was that bad fish from last night or what's the deal? You know, is, do I really understand this? But he went on rejoicing because he understood what this meant for him. He understood he was saved and he was headed to heaven. He was so excited. Uh, Arrhenius, one of the early church fathers, says that uh, this Ethiopian went on to be a missionary in, in Ethiopia. And so uh, the ends of the earth, and that's where the gospel is going. So cool uh, when you put the whole Bible together, which is what we're talking about today. And the first thing is that the Old Testament is foundational for his story. The foundational is, or the Old Testament is foundational for his story, right? Uh, as you look at it, a lot of us, uh, we, we love the New Testament. If I'm going to ask you, if you're a follower of Jesus, and I'm going to ask you, I said, hey, do you like to read the Old Testament better or the New Testament better? Most people will say the New Testament, right? 
We are a New Testament church. We are, we are founded on, on, Christianity is founded on Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, and, and so we'll say, that, that's, that's the part I would like reading best. When, when I go through the Bible, read through the Bible, I don't know if you guys are like me, when I read through the Bible, uh, I, it sounds bad. I, I read the Old Testament, I love it, I get a lot of stuff out of it, but I'm so excited to jump into Matthew. I, I, when I get there, it's like, whew, I, I made it, right? And, and that's kind of how we are. As a matter of fact, there's some churches and there's some denominations that say, Ah, don't worry about the Old Testament. Now, you don't need that. But I want to tell you that is so not true. Now, the Old Testament is about his story, right? That's God's story. If you put his story together, uh, those two words together, what's it make? Wow. So like the rest of you, if you put his and story together, uh, uh, what, what's that make? All right. So, so about two more answered that time. That's good. Uh, apparently we're not getting any better, but yeah, it's, it's history, right? So history is about God. It's about his, he gets to write it because he created it. And so you have the OG, right? The old Testament telling about the coming of the new guard coming of, of, of Jesus and, and the new Testament is the fulfillment of the old Testament, which is so cool. And, and it, it doesn't fulfill everything from the old Testament because some of the old Testament talks about the end of time and that's still to come, but it fulfills a lot of the old Testament about Jesus. And, and there's these promises and these prophecies called messianic prophecies. And, and they're the ones that God said, hey, I'm sending a deliverer. I'm sending someone who is the chosen one, the anointed one, the savior of the world. I'm sending him uh, to you. And that's what Isaiah 53 is talking about, where the Ethiopian was reading. It's talking about Jesus giving of himself for your sins, my sins, the Ethiopian sins, Philip's sins, the sins of the world. And we need the Old Testament to understand the New Testament even better. It's like you can have the New Testament only, right? You've seen those little uh, Gideon Bibles that are New Testament only. And that's great. That's good. That's going to do a lot of things. Uh, That's like listening to a program on the radio, right? When you have the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's like watching in high definition color because you understand so much more about what's happening and transpiring and why the New Testament is the way it is and why Jesus did what he did, why Paul did what he did. And so we understand that foundational part of the Old Testament. So, so I tell you this so that you might know, never forego the Old Testament. It is so important. It's foundational, right? It, it, it says so much about the beginning, who God is and how God loves us and wants us to be with him, uh, which is why he sent Jesus. And Jesus comes to fulfill the Old Testament. He, he, he comes and he says in Matthew 5, 17, he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. And it's important for us to understand in Judaism, in the Old Testament, there's two things they hang on, the law and the prophets, right? The law is the, the book of Moses, uh, what he wrote, and he represents the law. Then you have Elijah that represents the prophets. Uh, there's a, a lot of prophets throughout the Old Testament. And then you have some wisdom literature and, and some history. But the law and the prophets, Jesus says, I've come to fulfill them. And, and, and so when we look in the Old Testament and we see this, uh, it, it comes to light when we understand Jesus is the fulfillment of so much, just as it did for the Ethiopian as he was in his chariot there. You know, Isaiah 53 was written over 700 years before Jesus came to earth. And it has prophesied so much about what he went through for you and for me. As a matter of fact, if you ask a Jewish person, uh, that a Messianic Jew, someone who is Jewish but has received Jesus Christ as Messiah, they'll tell you that Isaiah 53 is the best chapter to use when showing other Jewish people that Jesus is the one that they've been looking for, uh, forward to coming since way back in Abraham's day. He's the one that, uh, matter of fact, first time Jesus is mentioned, well, if we're going to be literal, in Genesis 1, it's talking about Jesus, which says, let us make God in, or let us make man in our image, right? But uh, the cross of Jesus is mentioned in Genesis 3.15, where, where God is talking to Satan. He says, you know what? I, I'm sending one that's basically going to save mankind, and you're going you're to strike his heel, but he's going to crush your head. And just in case you don't know, uh, getting struck on the heel is, is a lot less than getting crushed in the head, right? And, and he's saying, Satan, you're going to lose because Jesus is going to win. It's so cool. And if you don't know about Jesus and want to know more about what it looks like to follow him and, and know more about his story, we would love for you to text the word follow to the number on the screen, and we'll have somebody get with you and, and talk to you about what that looks like. It's the most important decision you can make. But as we look at the Old Testament here in Isaiah 53, we've got to know it's foundational uh, to his story. It's foundational to the cross and resurrection and, and to hope that we have in eternity. Second thing we can see is that obedience is the proper response to his story. Obedience is the proper response to a story. Philip was told by an angel to go. He got up and went. Philip was told by uh, the spirit to get up by the chariot, and, and he got over by the chariot, and he interpreted what the man was reading. 
He, he did what he was called to do. And then the Spirit takes him away to continue to preach elsewhere. He was, he was obedient. He was obedient to the commission of Jesus to go and make disciples. And the same commission that you and I are given as followers of Jesus. The Ethiopian... He was obedient to the Spirit's prompting that he might, he might understand that he's, he, he needs a Savior and, and that Jesus is that Savior, that suffering servant, and he, he receives him. And, and as the later text says, he says, I, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and, and he follows through with, with baptism immediately. Uh, he's obedient to that. By the way, if you've never been uh, baptized into Christ, we would encourage you to be obedient in that. That's what, that's what the Word calls us to and to be faithful in that. We, we'll do that any day or night if it's after the hours of 10 p.m. One of our other pastors would love to meet you here and do that. But, uh, you know, we, we, we want us all to be obedient to what, what God says here. If you haven't been obedient, now's the time. And I love the Ethiopians. Obedience leads to him rejoicing. Leads to him rejoicing. And when we truly understand what God has done for us in Jesus, we should always be rejoicing, even when we go through those dark times and the valleys and the rain that comes our way. So what do we do with this? What, what are our now what's today? First of all, the Spirit still leads. The Spirit still leads. Holy Spirit has not stopped leading, right? He, he didn't stop leading once the Bible was done. He didn't stop leading uh, once, once we see Jesus leave. He, as a matter of fact, that's when he really took off. He still leads today. For everyone who has received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and asked forgiveness for their sins and are striving to live for him, the Holy Spirit is in us and we're to listen to him. He still leads. You know, the reason why we don't hear God lead us like Philip did is because of all the distractions, right? All the distractions. See, even in 10 seconds of silence, some of us can feel a little weird because we're like, oh, man, there's got to be noise. There's got to be something going on. And plus, you never thought that I'd stop talking for 10 seconds. <laughs> man, we need to be listening to the Spirit of God. He still leads, and he wants to lead us, just like he led Philip, just like he led the early church. He wants to, but we, we walk inside, and we have all these distractions coming on. We have notifications on our phone. We have uh, TV stuff. We have stuff on the computer. We have shows we got to watch. We have all these things. We have, we have sports that we got to take kids to. We've got uh, dance. We've got singing. We've got all these different activities we got to get to and make sure that we're taking care of those, and we don't slow down to listen. And you know how else you can know how the Spirit leads? By being in his word. Being in his word. God tells us so much of what we long to know if we would just be in his word and know what he's called us to and, and know what we can call on him for. We need to be led by his spirit. When, we, when, we read the Bible, when you read the Bible, by the way, uh, every time you read the Bible, pray, Holy Spirit, reveal to me what you mean. Holy Spirit, reveal to me what I need to know from this passage. And it's going to be, it, it, it needs to be the same. Now, we're in different circumstances, but the, the truth is the truth. And, and so we pray that. We pray for the Spirit to lead us. And we need to know his word so we can be equipped. Paul says this in Romans 8, 12 through 14. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh. And what he's talking about is the, is the sinful nature, the carnal nature, right? He's not talking about flesh and bones, but he's talking about the carnal nature, which is the, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, uh, uh, lust of the eyes. It's, it's saying we need to not live by that, right? For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. And that's, that's an eternal death. All of us will physically die, but that's an eternal death. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. We need to be still and listen. He is still leading. He still wants to tell us things and show us things and help us be who he wants us to be. We need to be faithful. You know, it, God can be hard to hear it at times because we don't posture our hearts right. And even times where we might be doing things, right, and, and maybe even going through the motions or whatever the case is, uh, even times where we're doing that, sometimes it's hard to hear. You know, I, I've experienced that some in, in my life over the past three months, and uh, it's, been, it's been a struggle, but we need to be faithful and push through. We know that there's, a, uh, there's this, this truth and this light that comes through Christ and into eternity that we can be excited about. One of our, our missionaries we support here, uh, I was reading her letter the other day, and, and she wrote this. She said, I've been going through a difficult time in ministry lately. 
She was talking about how it hasn't been going as well. She hasn't seen as many people come through and had as many opportunities to share faith. And she says, I am humbled yet again that my success is measured in my faithfulness. Right? That, that's, that's so true. So, so often we measure success by numbers and, and people and dollars and all that. But being a follower of Christ, success is about staying faithful. Right, I, uh, as as we walk through understanding, uh, you know, this this past few months, even as uh, Jesus is my treasure, um, I was. I, I don't think I told you guys this yet, but I, I was even thinking about getting a tattoo on my wrist of a treasure box, right? Just so every time I looked, every treasure, I was thinking about that. And this is not a joke. I was thinking about that within sixty seconds of my motorcycle accident. I was like, "Man," and you're like, "Well, maybe you shouldn't have been looking at your wrist. You should have been looking at the road." Um, but I was. It was gravel. It was a whole other thing. Now I have a surgery scar on the bottom and the top, and so I guess that's my treasure to remember as I look at that. Right? That, that we stay faithful even in the midst of trials and tribulations. And, and some of you are going through so much. You're going through so much more than I did. You're going through so much that uh, it's financial woes, it's relationship woes, it's physical woes, it's dealing with the loss of a loved one woes, it's all this stuff, and you're in this valley and you're in darkness. And I want to tell you that God still wants to lead. He just wants you to be faithful. Trust him through the process, right? Spirit still leads, and we are to still follow. We are to still follow. Uh, there's, there's a word that comes when you think about following Jesus that it, it's, not, it, it's not a word that they will say a lot in society today because it seems demeaning and degrading and you don't want this, right? It's this word of obedience. When, when we hear the word obedience, automatically we think, well, what am I, a dog? Did I have to obey? What, what, what do you mean? You know, that, and it's got this negative connotation. And yet in the context of Scripture, obedience to the Lord is beautiful. And what it brings is beautiful. Being obedient to the Lord means we've got to die to ourself, right? Jesus said this in Luke 9, 23, whoever wants to be my disciple uh, must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. I, you know what? In, in that passage, there's a ton of good things, but the word that stands out as we talk about faithfulness is daily, right? Daily. Daily. And Jesus himself says God causes the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous and the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. There's going to be bad days. There's going to be good days. There's going to be circumstances that, that dictate that. But we're to take up our cross, deny ourselves daily, and follow him, be obedient to him. And that, that's for all those who are Christ followers. If you're not a Christ follower, so glad you're here. I hope, I hope we're uh, kind of unveiling what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We'd love, as I said earlier, to talk to you about that. Matter of fact, we have a website to give you some more information on what that looks like at uh, nowwhat.love, www.nowwhat.love. If you want to check that out, we'd love for you to go there. Because Jesus told us, he reminded us in John 8, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, whoever's obedient to me, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but we'll have the light of life. Now, at first glance, you might look at that and say, oh, that means that when I follow Jesus, everything's just going to be rosy and everything's going to be great and I'm never going to have a bad day. That's not what that means. What that means, that, that darkness means uh, a spiritual darkness. That means being lost, always searching for something more. And Jesus says, I am the light. I am the one that will show you the way, and I'll show you to eternity, and I'll take your sins away. I'll do all these wonderful things for you spiritually, but you're going to have bad times. You're going to have terrible things happen in your life because we live in a fallen world. But he says, remember, I'm the light of the world. You'll never walk in darkness spiritually, but you'll have the light of life, no matter what you're going through, to stay faithful. And there are many who need to hear the, the good news like the uh, Ethiopian needed to hear. There's many that need to hear it. And a lot of people say, well, okay, I'll, just, I'll, be, a, I'll be a good Christian. I'll go to church. I'll, I'll read my Bible every day, and, and I'll just live a life where people can say, hey, I want that. And that's great. Continue to do that. That's definitely there. But God's called us to share. To share about Jesus. Right? Paul says in Romans chapter 10, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one on whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? And here it goes. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. 
Now, if you think that's talking about just preachers, because it says someone preaching to them, you, you don't understand. The, the preaching is just talking about proclaiming the good news. And we're all called to do that. That's the Great Commission, that we would go out and we would share Jesus to the ends of the earth. We're called to do that. We need to be faithful to do that. I, I read a story on a, a young man at the age of, of 13. Uh, he uh, was on a motorbike accident and uh, uh, put him in the hospital. He was in a coma for three and a half months. And at the end of the three and a half months, they said, hey, we're just going to send him home to, uh, to, uh, to die in, in comfort and surrounded by family. And a few days after his home, his, his toes started moving. And then a few days later, his hands did. And, and then he was able to open his eyes. He was able to talk uh, with his parents. And, and he told a story of something that happened in his three and a half months in the coma. Now, I'm going to put a little disclaimer on this before I tell you the story. I don't, I'm, I'm skeptical when it comes to people saying they've gone to heaven or hell, right? I'm skeptical of those things just because I don't want to be, there's a lot of people that have been bamboozled into believing false things when they follow people that, that say those things and think, oh, well, I got I to gotta trust them. But I will look at things and see, does it match up with scripture? And if so, who am I to say it didn't happen, right? And so Micah tells his parents after he woke up out of the coma, he told them that he, he actually saw Jesus. And here's what he says he saw. He says, I turned around and was looking in the face of Christ, and the angels were just worshiping, and there's no explanation of how much joy I had. Okay? I, you're like, well, is that true, Jeff? I don't know, but I'll tell you this. It matches up with what Scripture says. He doesn't say, oh, I saw Aunt Gertrude. I saw my little pet Fluffy. I saw all, you know, all these. He says, I saw Jesus, and the angels were worshiping him, and I had so much joy. Okay? That matches up with heaven. I'm not saying it's 100% true, but I, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. And he says, when he was talking to Jesus, he said, I'm going to send you back. And Micah said, why? And then he said, they must know about my love and my father's love for everyone, no matter what they have done. I will love them and forgive them and accept them if they come to the cross. So in the picture that we have here, you see he's in a wheelchair. As you can see, he can't do everything on his own. He'd be much better off if he was still in heaven. And yet he says, Jesus sent him here. And he goes on. And now it's just about seven years after the coma, that picture there. He's now in his early 20s. He said this, why would I spend my time here and get other people sad or depressed uh, or disappointed when I could elevate them and make them feel the joy and the love that I did in heaven? Our life here on earth is short. And why would you like to waste your small time here on earth being sad? What's a little cast for 12 weeks? What's going through some financial difficulties? What's going through some relational issues uh, that are temporary compared to what we see Micah's going through? And he says, hey, well, I'm, I'm going to be here and I'm going to show the love of Christ even though I can't do a lot of things on my own. And why would I want to make people sad? Why would we waste our small amount of time here on earth being sad? Man, may we never, may we never stop having the joy of the Lord even when times are tough. We are to never stop, right? That's our theme this year, never stop. I don't know if you've heard this verse before, but there's a verse in Acts that says, day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Hopefully you have. We've said it like 40 times this year, okay? So that's our whole board, the board's out there. That's about, that's about that, that we'd be uh, sharing the news. And uh, we're to never stop. There's a, there's a guy, if, you, if you're on TikTok, there's a guy that uh, I want you to follow. Uh, it's prison, to ch prison, the number two church planter. Uh, follow him. His name is Matt Allen. He, he uh, is, is a church that we support in, in Radiant. It's like, a, it's like a, a grand, it's a, let's see, Radiant in Wichita is uh, like a daughter church. And then Radiant, Ohio is granddaughter. So this would be a great, great granddaughter. And this guy, he was in prison for quite a while, and then uh, he got saved, and he came out, and he wants to tell people about Jesus started a church in the projects in Dayton. And uh, um, I, when I just, when I hear, when he sends us videos, and he, he sends stuff, what's going on, he's talking to drug dealers and prostitutes and pimps and all these people, uh, right, where they're exchanging drugs and all outside uh, where they do church. I, I want to show you just a little bit of him. You're going to see a 30-second clip here of uh, Matt Allen here. Hey, what's up, homie? Let me pop it with you for a second. My name's Brother Matt. Some people know me as prison the pastor, but everybody knows that I'm in love with Jesus, 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 homie. 
That is the gospel, amen? It's not about me. It's not about you. It's only about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Not but for real. This Saturday, this 22nd, 6 p.m., we're going to be posted up in the Soda Bass Projects in West Dayton, Ohio. How many of you, if I got up here and said, hey, let me pop it with you, homie, you'd be like, what? He must not have been wearing his helmet. Uh, but, uh, you know, you'd be saying things like that when, when, when Matt is doing a wonderful job reaching people with the gospel in a different way than we would. Jesus, 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 homie. When I think about him, I think of someone who's passionate. You know what's interesting? If we look at Philip, we see him in, in chapter 6. We see him at 8. We're going to see him again in chapter 21. And he's gone from this deacon to being this guy that's doing what God's called him to do. In, in 21 verse 8, Here's how he's defined. The one word they define Philip with, as Luke writes this, that he's Philip the evangelist. That's how he's known. That's how he's known as the evangelist, the one who's taking good news and sharing the good news. If you were to have people around you say, here's the one word I'd say about you, here's what I would say uh, sums you up, what would that word be? You know, if it was me, would they say pastor, father, husband, you know, whatever? Whatever. What would they say about you? Would it be about your family? Would it be about your sports team? Would they say, oh, you're a great Chiefs fan? Would it be about your money? Oh, you're rich. Or would it be about Jesus? I think we should all take a moment to evaluate ourselves and say, what would they say about me? And if we don't like the answer, let's become more like Philip. Let's become more like Micah. Let's become more like Matt. That we'd be faithful to let him lead and never stop. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look in your word today. We thank you for uh, what you've said that has been true for uh, thousands of years. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be yours through the, uh, the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus. And we thank, thank you so much for the hope of eternal life through the empty grave. And Father, I pray that we would not keep it to ourselves, that we would be faithful to let you lead. Lord, and if you call us to go up next to someone riding their bike, if you call us to go up next to our coworker, or our classmate, or our neighbor, that we'd be willing to be faithful. Lord, would you find us faithful? We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.